Good afternoon. Um, it's 12 o'clock. The time has come upon us. So this is a part one of two series about neuroendocrine diagnostic that's being hosted by us here at the Christie through the Pet City Academy. And we've got uh, three speakers. Uh, we're going to come up back to back and then we'll pick the questions at the end for the last 10 minutes. With regards to people attending the actual webinar, if you could put your questions into the Q&A section of, the, um, of, your, of your desktop or your pad. With regards to technical issues, please enter the questions into the chat box and either Kevin or David will pick them up and try and deal with things as they go on. So today we start off with PET CT imaging of neuroendocrine tumors. And I'm just gonna name all the speakers for now. So it's gonna be Dr. Tom, Thomas Westwood looking at appropriate and effective application of somatostatin receptor PET, C, PET and FTG traces. After that, we're gonna be followed by Andy Connolly who's gonna look at patient preparation and imaging for gallium dota talk PET CT. And then Dr. Ami Chanda will pick up interesting cases with a particular focus on SPEC CT versus PET CT. And then we'll have the Q&A session. So we start the session off with uh, Tom Westwood. Tom, up, up, off to Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Tom Westwood. I'm one of the radiology consultants at the Christie. I'm just going to share my screen with you, looking at those thumbnails. Hopefully, Pete Julian will teach us about juggling fire as well as everything else. Now, hopefully, you can see my slides now. So PET-CT imaging of neuroendocrine tumors. Well, um, neuroendocrine tumors are um, quite a complex tumor group, um, which constitute a range of different tumors originating in different areas of the body. Um, they, um, I think a really important point to, to stress right at the outset is that um, whilst they constitute a range of different tumors, these are, cancers, they're malignant tumors, and um, they range from slower growing cancers to rapidly growing cancers. They don't range from benign lesions to malignant lesions. Um, the reason I stress that is that is something that historically hasn't been particularly well appreciated in the medical fraternity, if you like, and, and even now um, isn't necessarily wholly um, realized. Um, and if people are patients are going to get the treatment that they require at the optimal time point, then it's essential that everyone recognizes that these are malignant, you know, cancerous, cancerous tumors. Um, and we don't sort of uh, leave lesions to progress before treating them as what they are. Um, part of the legacy of that um, is that they were previously uh, referred to as carcinoids and um, the the more accurate terminology now is is neuroendocrine tumor and we still use carcinoids um, to describe the lung lesions quite frequently um, but carcinoid tends to be a a, uh, a, a term that has more of a, a sort of um, old-fashioned approach um, and if we want to to correctly recognize these as malignant cancers, then, then it's better to use the more accurate up-to-date terminology. And the reason they're called neuroendocrine is they arise from a common precursor endocrine cell, and which also shares some nerve elements, so neuroendocrine. Um, and because that is found throughout the body, the tumors can arise in a whole range of positions in the body. Um, and mixing this range of behavior from slower growing to more rapidly growing and different areas in the body makes it quite a difficult group of tumors to manage. Um, this graph demonstrates um, the incidence of malignant tumors in general, so all cancer types and how it's rising steadily in the, in the population versus the incidence of neuroendocrine tumors in the population. Um, and it's, it's useful just to demonstrate the, uh, what I was talking about earlier about the, um, the increased recognition of these cancers, because it's likely that um, there is a increased rate of neuroendocrine tumors in line with the general increase in, in cancers in the population. But at least some of this rapid rise in neuroendocrine tumors compared to other cancer types 
um, is due to the fact that we're um, improving in how we recognize these tumors as what they are. Previously, when imaging and patholo pathological analysis was less um, sophisticated, there was a whole host of lesions, um, particularly in the lungs, that were dismissed as you know pulmonary hamartomas or the benign lung entities, and now being recognized um, as neuroendocrine tumors and being adequately treated because of that. So what gives rise to such a range of behavior? Well, this is a really important concept, so I'll dwell on it a little bit. Um, and it's that the tumors uh, vary in their sort of pathological constitution. So they vary between being well, very well differentiated, which means that they resemble um, the sort of textbook perfect neuroendocrine tumor with all the hallmarks of neuroendocrine tumors in each of the cells um, very well. Um, we call those well differentiated right through to very poorly differentiated tumors where very few of the tumors have the hallmark features on, uh, on pathology of neuroendocrine tumors. Um, and they beha behave much more like nonspecific uh, carcinomas and, and tend to behave much more aggressively. And the way we can classify tumors as being one or the other is through biopsy. Um, on the biopsy, the pathologist or the histopathologist looks at a, this marker called KI67, which is a marker of cellular proliferation. So how quickly, how rapidly the cell is dividing. Um, and it's you know, literally counting these little dark dots. Um, and judging how many there are per high power field and, and, and classifying the, um, the tumor along those lines. And you can see in this tumor, this is quite a, a, a zoomed out image. There's uh, quite few of these, um, these, these, these dots. This one in the middle, um, there's more, and this one's absolutely packed with them. So this is, these, these tumors through that, if there's a KI67 index of less than 2%, um, we classify a grade one or well differentiated tumor. Um, if the KI67 index is two to 20%, it's classed as grade two, which is like a moderately differentiated tumor. And grade three, a poorly differentiated tumor, has a KI67 index of over 20%. And that's how we are able to make sense of the behavior of the tumors on biopsy. Um, and it's a very important concept for imaging because it also allows us to make appropriate choice of imaging technique. Um, and image the patients appropriately. The reason for that is the grade one and to some extent the grade two tumors, um, one of their hallmarks is that they overexpress um, a receptor on the cell surface. So each cell of the, of the tumor has these receptors very highly overexpressed called somatostatin receptors. Um, and as the tumor de-differentiates, um, there's less and less of this and receptor expression and tumors um, become less able to be imaged by somatostatin receptor imaging. Um, but um, fortunately, they, they, one of the, as a sort of, as a balance to that, um, they tend to, because of behaving much more aggressively, they upregulate glucose metabolism, which is a hallmark of, of aggressive tumors generally. Um, and they become more able to be imaged with FDG. So as a sort of, general um, concept, well differentiated tumors um, are more appropriate for somatostatin receptor imaging and poorly differentiated tumors are more appropriate for, for FDG PET CT imaging. So when we talk about somatostatin receptor imaging, um, we are uh, looking, you know, although it's a very advanced way of doing it, um, at quite a, a typical nuclear medicine technique of a radiopharmaceutical um, binding to a target and the radiopharmaceutical being composed of a radionuclide um, with a linker molecule attaching it to a ligand which is able to bind with the target and then you can image the, um, the radioactive decay. Now um, in the case of, 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 of uh, neuroendocrine tumor imaging we're talking about gallium um, dota peptide PET-CT so the gallium is the radionuclide, the dota molecule is the linker and the peptide is a, is a conjugated octreotide, so that's your NOC or your TOC or, or whichever, um, whichever radiopharmaceutical you're using. Um, and the target is the somatostatin receptor. 
Now, the great advantage of this way of imaging is that um, you're imaging a, 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 a cell surface receptor that's very highly overexpressed. Um, and therefore, the, the cell's going to take up a lot of your, your, um, your radioisotope. But also that the because of the um, particular radiopharmaceuticals that are used, um, they have excellent recept uh, excellent affinity for the receptors. So once you add those two factors together, you get really fantastic target to background um, contrast. Um, I don't know what's happened to the little red arrows there. They should be pointing at these dots. But this is just an example of this. So this is a CT scan in a patient with neuroendocrine tumor. And this is the aorta here and, and the diaphragm. And there's these two tiny little nodules either side of the aorta, um, which are you know only a couple of millimeters across, but show really high uptake on the, um, the dotapeptide PET. Um, so you get very good sensitivity for small lesions when you've got the right tumor biochemistry. Um, contrasting that with FDG, um, with FDG, you're imaging glucose metabolism. Now, to my knowledge, all cells in the body, for, for them to be alive, must have energy and metabolize glucose. Um, someone will probably be screaming at the screen that there's an exception to the rule but um but in general glucose metabolism is pretty fundamental to um to to human cells um which means that by its very nature you aren't going to have good target to background contrast so whilst in um in dota peptide pet imaging we can move away from this traditional concept of of pet having a certain size threshold around eight millimeters in size and, and recognize that tiny lesions can be targeted. Um, FDG PET imaging is, is less sensitive. And that means that they can't, the two techniques can't just be switched for one another depending on the tumor biology because you can't expect a two millimeter lesion to be detected on FDG image. Um, now that was the sensitivity we're talking about, but um, what about the specificity? Now we've already kind of covered specificity for glucose metabolism because we've said it's just completely non-specific in fact it's probably if you were trying to find something that was non-specific that was going on in the human body glucose metabolism would be a good place to look um but what about the specificity of um of uh, somatostatin receptor imaging well although um although the the receptor density is very dense in the well and, and moderately differentiated in your endocrine tumors, um, you can't expect this to be entirely specific. Um, you just have to look at a, a normal distribution of, um, of gallium dotapeptide uptake in the, the human body to realize, well, actually, there's masses of somatostatin receptors in the spleen, in the adrenals, in the liver. Um, they aren't neuroendocrine tumors. Um, and as such, why would all tumors um, also, uh, the uh, you know why, why would the only tumor type that expresses these be be neuroendocrine tumors? Um, so, as a couple of examples, uh, well, actually, you know, before we go into the examples, um, there's a whole range of other tumor types that um, that overexpress somatostatin receptors. Um, these are the ones that's generally useful for imaging the neuroendocrine tumors, um, but um, thyroid cancers, melanomas some skin cancers, um, lung cancers, they can all show uptake of, um, on gallium dotapeptide PET, uh, as can inflammatory changes, which is probably somewhere in this, this other list of things that show uptake. As examples, um, this is a patient who had a, a known small bowel neuroendocrine tumor, but on their scan also had uptake in the thyroid and the left tonsil, um, and these were biopsy proven to be a thyroid cancer and a tonsillar lymphoma. This is a patient with a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, but also with a, a renal cell cancer. You can see that the renal cell cancer is, up to, is taking up um, the radiopharmaceutical um, equally, at least as intense as the um, liver, if not more. Um, and the, the, the learning point here is that although this is a fantastic imaging technique. 
and that we do get very intense uptake with good um, signal to background contrast in um, in the if, we, if it's used correctly in the neuroendocrine uh, cancer patients um, it can't be used as a substitute for biopsy so patients must also have biopsy confirmation of tumor we can't just say this is a neuroendocrine tumor and it's well differentiated um, because it isn't it's a thyroid cancer um, so um, it can't be used um, particularly given that um, it's a relatively scarce resource in the country at the moment you can't go straight to gallium pet imaging um, before your biopsy so to expand a bit more on this um, the role of gallium beta peptide pet ct um, staging proven um, neuroendocrine tumors is much more appropriate than using this on anything that you ex you suspect to be a neuroendocrine tumor um, so by staging, that means establishing how advanced the tumor is in the body and how many places it's spread to. Um, detection of an occult primary tumor. So that's when a patient presents with metastases um, and they do a biopsy and it's shown to be neuroendocrine tumor, but we don't know where in the body exactly it's come from and therefore we don't know how best to, to, to treat the patient. Um, and uh, sometimes when you do a, a PET CT, you find a lesion that we've sort of not been able to see for various reasons on other imaging techniques. Um, and you can establish that as a primary tumor. Um, when patients have been treated and um, you suspect that there's a recurrent disease, but you can't find it on CT or MR, for example, that's another, um, another important use, a detection of recurrent disease. And pre-therapy assessment, um, by which we're referring to um, radionuclide therapies and um, we'll cover that in the in the second webinar of the series um, moving on to the role of fdg um, the point to stress here is that it's not just a case of doing both fdg pet ct and gallium beta peptide pet ct in each patient so you, that you get as much information as possible um, i think that'd be quite a, I mean, I don't doubt that that's sometimes how, um, how patients are imaged, but um, that sort of blunderbuss approach is, is quite wasteful with healthcare resource and also um, frequently doesn't add anything to patient management. So you, you need to have a question to answer really to make FDG PET-CT worthwhile. We're generally using these in patients with higher KI-67 levels, so more d different differentiated tumors that are behaving more aggressively, quite often those patients whose cancers are behaving very aggressively um, present at a much more advanced stage so where there's much more widely metastatic disease. And in those cases, um, it often doesn't make any difference if you're, if you're picking up the two millimeter um, node or all the little um, you know, nodes and, and small bone lesions elsewhere in the body. Um, you can, you, you uh, are often best served by imaging those patients with CT um, because there's disease that you can detect on CT. Um, so, so you want to have a specific question before using FTG PET CT in these patients, um, by which I mean it often comes down to um, this concept of tumor heterogeneity. Now, I don't want to dwell on this too much because I think it might be revisited later on by my colleague. Dr. Chanda, and I think my time's gonna be up in a second. However, um, some tumors um, or some patients have tumors of different levels of differentiation. And a biopsy might say um, that they have a well-differentiated tumor, but the gallium pep dota peptide PET might say, well, this isn't behaving like a well-differentiated tumor, this is behaving like a more aggressive tumor. And in that case, you might do both um, scan types to give you a better impression of whether there are elements of well-differentiated and poorly differentiated tumors in the same patient. And this is just examples of that, but I think we're gonna be going into that um, again in a, in a later talk. So in summary, gallium beta peptide imaging has transformed the imaging of neuroendocrine tumors. As with FDG, um, somatostatin receptor PET-CT is nonspecific, um, so it has to be accompanied by biopsy. FDG is best used as a problem-solving tool, not just something to be done in every patient, um, they are a complex tumor group, so keep an open mind.
Thank you. I think questions are going to be at the end of the, um, the webinar. Excellent, Tom. Thank you for that uh, good presentation and differentiating what sort of tracer we use for which patient group. So we're going to move quickly along to Andy Connolly, looking at the patient preparation when the patient does come for the scan, uh, specifically with regards to gallium dotted block PET CT. Andy, uh, off to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have a slight technical hitch. So um, David is going to be um, doing my slides for me at my command. So my name is Andy Connolly. I'm a, a radiographer, the a deputy lead technician in the nuclear medicine department here. Uh, at the Christie. And I'm just going to run through the practical issues um, we've come across uh, scanning patients yep. using the gallium daughter scans. Uh, okay, uh, next slide, please. Um, the topics we're going to cover loosely are uh, patient preparation, uh, the dose that we give, uh, drawing up and actually administering the doses. Uh, a little bit about the uptake phase uh, and the scanning protocols uh, and aftercare, if, if any. Uh, next slide, please, Dave. The major difference between the gallium and the FDG PET is because we're not looking at, um, we're not using glucose, there is no fasting, which solves no end of problems, has its own concomitant problems, but uh, uh, we don't have to. Uh, be unnecessarily cruel to our patients. They can eat what they like before they come. Um, if they're on any medication, we don't have any issues um, with that, unless they are on the uh, somatostatic analogs, the long and short acting lanreotide or octreotide injections. Uh, currently, what we do here at the Christie is if they're on the monthly injections, then we tend to book it in the fourth week um, so preferably a few days before they get their next injection so that the, the body isn't to wash with somatostatin analogs before we um, inject them with our dotapeptides. If they are on the daily injections of the short acting um, lanretide or octretides, then it's advisable um, <clears throat> for them to stop doing that for 12 to 24 hours uh, before they turn up in the department. Okay, thanks Dave. <clears throat> there is, um, you can make the case that um, scanning could take place at any time during the lanretide octreotide injection cycle. There is information out there um, to, to argue it either way uh, without having to wait until near the um, time of the next one. However, the protocol that we use here at the Christie is to scan, as I said, in the week prior to injection. Uh, if anybody wants to request a gallium scan um, outside of that particular point in the cycle, um, we're quite happy to do it if they chat to our RSAT license holders like Tom and Prakash and Ami, who will be no doubt be very happy to talk to them about it uh, and persuade them one way or the other. Uh, okay, thank you, Dave. Um, under the heading of managing symptomatic patients, as a rule at the point of uh, diagnostic imaging, um, they tend not to be displaying any symptoms which would uh, compromise um, doing the scan. This is more likely to happen um, if they attend for the treatment phase later on, which again will be covered uh, in the um, second part of the webinar next month. Uh, and as ever, a discussion between the referrer and our site holders uh, comes in very useful uh, to cover any topics uh, that referrers might have. Okay, thanks Dave. Um, dose, there are two ways you can dose your patient with the appropriate amount uh, of the tracer, um, you can do it by just a standard dose per patient, um, but we're currently doing it um, a dose by patient weight so that every patient that turns up on the day gets the same amount of activity per kilo. The DRL, um, the dose reference level is 250 megabacrels. We don't want to go above that um, because it's technically it's illegal. So we, uh, we have a maximum dose of 250 megabacrels. Okay, thank you, Dave. We're currently using two megabacrels, two megabacrels per kilogram, um, up to a maximum of 250 kilos. We have a minimum thrown in there as well of 50 megabacrels, which obviously would be a very small patient, about 25 kilos. Um, we've never done any pediatric patients that I'm aware of. 
um, so we've never had to go that low. The amount you get comes out of the radio pharmacy uh, and will vary as time goes by because it's produced from uh, a generator which will decay over time and you get less and less as time progresses. Um, if you don't have enough when it appears to give two megabecquerels per kilogram, you can reduce it down to 1.5 megabecquerels, or if you've got a bit more, you can do 1.8, 1.7. If you don't have enough to do 1.5, then a quick chat to your friendly neighborhood radiologist, uh, uh, and they will be able to advise whether you've actually got enough to make a, a meaningful image, or whether you need to just rebook it at a point where you've got some more uh, data to play with. We tend to get two or three patients turning up um, per day that we're doing these types of scan. Um, we ask them to all arrive at the same time. Uh, and when they arrive, we give our radio pharmacy the nudge and they start the process of producing the daughter peptides for us. OK, thank you, Dave. Um, it usually takes them about an hour to produce the stuff uh, and then they bring it uh, off from the radio pharmacy. Um, it usually turns up in approximately four mils and we will get two or three doses out of it, uh, as it says, depending on the age of the generator. Three doses is good. Um, at the first, in the first sort of month or so of the um, life of the generator, which has a, a kind of life expectancy of about nine months, um, two doses takes us through uh, most of the intervening time. We inject the patients at 35 minute intervals, um, mainly because it takes about half an hour to do the scan. Uh, and then the decay factor for gallium uh, at 35 milli minutes is 0 0.7. And it makes the sums easier when you've got a little calculator out and you're working out what dose to give them. Uh, OK, Dave, thank you. Uh, it's slightly more technical than getting a calculator out. We have a spreadsheet where we uh, enter the details of the vial as it turns up from radio pharmacy. So it has a, a measured um, dose uh, that you've received uh, and the calibration time you put into it, the time that you want to do your first injection, the delay between injections and the number of patients that you want to inject. Uh, and also input into it your patient weights. Uh, it's always vitally important to get your patient's weights uh, and the dose per kilogram you're expecting to get out of it. Um, it will then tell you how much activity you need to withdraw. So in this case here, we've got the first patient, you're drawing 159 and a half megabecquerels up. Um, at the same time, you then draw 142 and a bit megabecquerels up for the second patient and 175 megabecquerels up for the third patient. So you withdraw them all at the same time. Uh, and by the time you get round to injecting your second and third patients after your 35 minute delay, um, there has been sufficient decay to in, uh, inject your patient with the appropriate dose per kilogram. Um, the next slide, please, Dave. That's just um, running over uh, the way we do it. It's a good idea to start with uh, injecting your heaviest patient and then working through to the lightest patient. Uh, because then you'll get the most out of the limited amount of stuff that you've got out of the radio pharmacy. Uh, next slide, please, Dave. So this uh, illustrates the point. If you've got three patients turning up of 175 and 50 kilograms, if you do the heaviest patient first, they require 200 megabecquerels at the point of injection. Patient two will require 214 megabecquerels, which is um, two times 75 divided by 0.7. Uh, and patient three, uh, 204 megabecquerels, which is two times 100 divided by 0 0.49, which is um, 70 minutes later. And the total activity you, you require in your vial from radio pharmacy to cover that is 618 megabecquerels. And you'll be scraping everything out the bottom of the vial. Um, if you do it the other way around with the lightest patient first, then uh, you need 214 megabecquerels for that patient. Uh, 100 megabecquerels, sorry, because they're only uh, 50 kilograms. 214 again for your second one, because you're still doing it in the same place, um, position. For patient number three, um, you require a total of 408 megabecquerels because you're doing it an hour and 10 minutes later. 
So if you add all those up, you need 722 megabacrounds in your vial at the start, and that's a hundred megabacrounds difference if you're getting towards the end of the generator's life where you, you can reasonably expect to get three patients out of it, then um, it can it can be a problem. You, you won't have enough to do your two megabacrounds per patient, and then you're starting to look at reduced dose uh, and possibly extended scan times as well. Uh, okay, thank you, David. The uptake phase um, is essentially the same as doing the uh, an FTG PET. We want a, a good 50 minutes um, for the daughter peptide to be taken up uh, by the body. Uh, unlike FDG PET, there aren't any restrictions or, on um, what they do in that amount of time. So we would normally restrict them from reading and getting up and walking around, going to the toilet, that sort of thing, because um, obviously you'll get uh, muscular uptake with the FDG. Um, but we don't need to worry about that. Uh, they just ask to rest. Um, it's a good idea to have them uh, in the uptake room that would you would same rooms that you'd use for the FDG pet. Um, given that you've just injected them with a high amount of a radioactive tracer, you don't want them wandering around through the rest of the department. So we just leave them in the uh, uptake room and asking them to rest. Okay, thank you, Dave. And the scanning protocols are essentially the same as doing an uh, FTG PET because you're covering the same area. So you start at the vertex and scan down to mid femur. Um, you would scan with the arms up unless you are particularly interested in brain, which I'll cover in a second. Um, we occasionally do um, contrast CT uh, with these um, scans as well. In fact, those are starting to become uh, more and more popular. Um, so we're doing more uh, contrast images with these as well. Uh, and occasionally, but very, very rarely, we will do a total body. We usually just do down to mid femur, uh, but on rare occasions, we have been asked to do total bodies. Okay, Dave, thank you very much. Um, gallium brain scanning is not common. We had a little bit of a, a chat about this um, at the Gallium Study Day a couple of weeks ago, uh, and we decided um, you would occasionally potentially get a men meningioma, uh, which would be useful to image using gallium. If you do come across the um, one of these brain scans, then we use 140 megabacrels fixed dose um, we're not doing it per kilogram uh, in this case, um, with a, a minimum of 100 megabacrels, um, so you're going to get uh, good images. A uh, 60 minute uptake time, just a slightly bit longer, um, just to make sure you've got sufficient uptake in the brain, uh, and then scan uh, on the appropriate headrest so your patient is nice and comfortable and is not going to move their head uh, with the arms down so they're not going to get in the way um, and cause any attenuation artifacts. Uh, and scan from the vertex to the base of the brain, and that should cover that. Uh, okay, thank you, David. Um, aftercare, there isn't a lot in the way of aftercare. Um, if you've done CT contrast, uh, then uh, your standard contrast aftercare, aftercare um, will come into practice um, with a leaflet if required to tell them where to go and what to do if they have any subsequent reaction. Uh, where, to, where and when to go for the results, um, if they've been on any short-acting um, lanreutine or oxide medication, they can resume that. Uh, and um, radiation protection advice, um, we would tend to ask them to avoid pregnant women and children for about four hours post-injection. Uh, and if they're breastfeeding, which seems unlikely, but you never know, to suspend breastfeeding for seven hours post-injection. And that's about that, I think, Dave, yes. Any questions we will do uh, uh, at the end of the session, as Prakash has said. Thank you very excellent. much. Excellent, Andy, thank you. Um, I just had a bit of a technical glitch there. My computer just died on me. <laughs> I managed to lock back in. Excellent talk. So it sort of gives you the practicality of how we actually scan the patient, how we deal with them as they come into the department. We'll pick up the questions later on. So we move quickly on to interesting cases, try and exp uh, express the the different traces and, and the kind of cases we see here in the department. So we've got Ami Chanda kicking off that very soon, out right now. So Ami, uh, off to you then, thanks. Thanks, Prakash. OK, 
Okay, so hopefully you can see my slides. I'm Amy Chandon, one of the radiology consultants at the Christie, and I'm going to go through some interesting cases with you today. Uh, so a brief outline of the talk. I'm going to speak um, about octreotide scan, the utility of it versus gallium PET CT very briefly. And then I'll go on to the cases gallium PET CT first and then FDG PET CT after those. Um, so until recently, octreotide scans were widely used to image neuroendocrine tumours and in some of your centres that will still be the case. Um, there was a paper a few years ago which looked at the role of gallium PET um, uh, versus octreotide scans and the findings are quite compelling and um, there's about 70% of patients where management was changed so it obviously um, change the algorithm um, of treatment in these patients. So it is the gold standard, although octreotide scan is um, considered still, you know, very much acceptable where gallium is not available. And I've got a series of images to show you just to highlight uh, the sensitivity, the superior sensitivity of gallium PET CT compared to octreotide scan. So both of these studies have been done in the same patient. This is the octreotide scan. So we've got some planar images here. And um, you can see that there is liver disease there, but compared to the gallium, there's an increased burden. So um, foci elsewhere within the thorax and elsewhere within the abdomen, you just can't appreciate on the octreotide. And these are the corresponding spec CT images for the octreotide scan compared with the gallium PET CT. So this area is obviously much better seen and there are additional lesions that cannot be identified on the octreotide spec CT. So moving on to clinical examples. So these are going to be gallium. Um, as Tom has already described, um, there are various indications that we use gallium PET CT for. One of them is in the detection of the primary tumour. And this is quite a key thing to establish if possible, because the patients get stratified down different um, treatment pathways according to that. So here we have a mesenteric mass. And that was the only finding on the diagnostic CT. Um, so it was felt that this was a neuroendocrine tumour. So the patient underwent uh, assessment with gallium PET CT. And the gallium PET CT showed two things. It showed that the mesenteric mass was highly tracer positive. And there was also another small focus in addition to that. And that uh, turned out to be a small bowel primary neuroendocrine tumour. So under normal circumstances, this patient would have been offered surgery um, as a curative treatment, but this patient opted not to uh, go for that um, and went on to somatostatin analog therapy. So we also use gallium for staging as well and in the assessment of disease burden. And uh, this example um, highlights how CT or MR uh, conventional cross-sectional imaging techniques can underestimate the burden of disease. So this patient was known to have uh, liver disease, liver metastases, and also there was a um, ileocecal mass there. A biopsy had been done, so we'd established already that this was a neuroendocrine tumour. But when we came to do the gallium PET CT, we got a bit of a shock because there was actually widespread disease and a lot of this was occult, so we couldn't see it at all on the um, CT. This area here caused uh, some concern because it looked like that there was activity actually encroaching into the spinal canal and possibly causing uh, spinal cord compression. And if you look on the CT, it's very difficult to actually um, say that that's abnormal. In, there is subtle uh, loss of the fat, which is very suggestive of mass, but it is a subtle finding considering the extent of the abnormality. Um, and this patient went on to have quite an urgent MR to, to assess the cord, and there was complete um, 
called spinal canal occlusion and the patient had to go on and be um, referred on to Salford for emergency radiotherapy and surgery. Because if this had been left much longer, this patient could have become tetraplegic, although he did walk into the department amazingly. Uh, so another example where disease is underestimated, so this patient um, had an MR spine, so there was a known uh, spinal metastasis and there was also um, a known sacral lesion, but and, and in retrospect you can see that there's a tiny focus of dural enhancement there, but that's a very hard pick and is very easy to miss. Um, it was suggested that this patient go on to have a gallium because there was some question about whether this lesion here was stable. Um, but what the gallium PET CT showed, so in addition to this very high intensity tracer uptake at the site of the uh, thoracic vertebral metastasis, there were other areas of more subtle but focal uptake. So um, there's a small focus of uptake there and then some smaller, um, more low grade activity at uh, other sites. Uh, and on the corresponding fusial axial images, um, again, it, it's fairly subtle, but there is uptake at those corresponding sites. So there was um, multifocal dural disease that you can't really appreciate on the cross-sectional imaging. And then a final example um, of um, underestimation of disease, but in the opposite direction. So this patient um, was, had, was known to have um, a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, um, which was resected um, and everything seems okay on the gallium. Uh, and the liver here looks like there's homogenous uptake within it, nothing of concern. But when the MRI liver was done, there were small lesions um, hyper enhancing on the vascular, on the arterial phase, as would be expected in um, a neuroendocrine tumor. So, and then more um, slightly, at a slightly different level. Um, so here, liver disease was underestimated on gallium PET CT and picked up on liver disease. And that's an important point that small liver lesions are better assessed on MR. Um, the spatial resolution of PET CT is not quite <clears throat> as good in that regard. So it, particularly in patients who are surgical candidates, um, if there's one liver lesion seen on gallium PET CT, the patient should always undergo liver MR prior to any radical form of treatment to exclude other smaller lesions, which would render a surgical approach obsolete. Oops. Okay, so moving on to high grade net. So all the uh, examples that I've shown to you up to this point have been low grade net and gallium PET CT in general is very good for that. In high grade net, um, it's much more variable. It can still be um, tracer positive, but you can also get underestimation of disease. So this patient was a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor and you have got very clear large liver metastases on both of these images. But when the patient went on to have a gallium PET CT, the lesions show photopenia compared to the background liver. And that is because as uh, neuroendocrine tumors become more aggressive and more high grade, they de-differentiate, so they lose their somatostatin receptor expression. And that is why you get um, a loss of uptake at those sites. So that's just another level there. So as Tom also um, highlighted in his talk earlier is that not everything that takes up gallium tracer is neuroendocrine tumor. There are multiple other entities that do. So this is a patient, a young patient who had um, a lesion in his neck and based on the location of that lesion, it's very closely related to the vessels. This was um, felt to be a paraganglioma, carotid body tumor and a gallium PET CT that was performed prior to resection showed that it was gallium positive with no disease elsewhere. 
So it was felt that surgery would be the best option for this patient. But over a series of um, weeks, the mass grew out of proportion with what would be expected um, for, a, for a tumor of that kind. And so um, red flags um, came up and the patient underwent a biopsy um, to look at that. And actually, it turned out to be uh, something else. So I will just briefly ask um, if anybody has any idea of what that pathology ended up being. You can uh, type something in the Q&A box. I'll just let you have a minute for that. Otherwise, I will tell you the answer. I can't see anything coming up, so I'm just going to tell you. So this turned out to be lymphoma um, and the PET CT. So this is an FDG PET CT now. The FDG PET CT shows that the extent of disease has increased and there's a small focus um, below that. So the patient um, underwent treatment for lymphoma rather than a resection. So it goes back to that um, principle that wherever possible, a lesion should be biopsied um, and, um, unless it's not feasible because it, it can be something else. This isn't um, specific for neuroendocrine tumor. So here again, we have a coronal image of a CT corresponding axial image, and then a gallium PET CT. So this region here is taking up a high degree of um, tracer uptake, and that turned out to be a splunculus. So, um, and if you look at the CT, it looks, the CT characteristics are very much like the spleen. And if we'd had an arterial phase um, CT, it would have enhanced the same as well. So it's just to highlight that um, this should not be mistaken for metastatic disease. Here it's in quite close proximity to the spleen, so it's easy. But after patients have had splenectomy, they can be dotted around the abdominal cavity. So it's always important to keep that in mind. Okay, and um, lastly, for this section, um, this is another maximum intensity projection of a gallium. Here we have pituitary uptake, which is physiological and it's seen in practically everybody, but there's an additional focus of activity um, elsewhere within the skull. Um, and the axial fused image, so you can see here there's misregistration because this um, superimposed PET image is out of sync with the CT. So this dot should actually be more towards the um, inside of the skull vault. Um, and this was a meningioma. It was advised that we do a, a MRI just to make absolutely sure. And there is a small amount of um, meningeal thickening there, which corresponds with that diagnosis. So um, other non-malignant um, processes. So this was a very good learning experience for us. Um, so this patient had a pancreatic net, it was resected and the post-operative CT did not show anything much at all, apart from a little bit of stranding in the fat. But when we did the gallium PET CT, there was this florid uptake in the region of um, surgery and also extending into the porta hepatis. And it, it was a very bizarre pattern of uptake, but um, it was felt that that was residual disease. Um, so the patient went on to somatostatin analogs. It was poorly tolerated, um, but um, continued with it. Um, but then after several years, the CT wasn't really showing any sign of progression. So we did another gallon PET CT and that uptake had resolved. So this was all an inflammatory process at the time of the post-operative um, gallium PET CT. So if inflammation can cause um, quite uh, marked uptake, not just cancer and not just neuroendocrine tumor. So that's the post-op CT. And F FDG PET CT has quite um, a specific role. Again, this has been highlighted previously. It's a problem solving tool in low grade nets. 
and it can also be used to grade um, more aggressive neuroendocrine tumours. So just a reminder of the uh, distribution of gallium compared to FDG PET-CT, uh, you get less brain uptake in gallium, you have pituitary uptake, the spleen is very hot on gallium and it's not so much on FDG PET-CT. Both traces are excreted by the renal system. So this patient had quite widespread disease. So there's a, a lung slash a mediastinal mass there, a breast mass, a renal mass, and that was biopsied and showed a low-grade neuroendocrine tumor. Um, and then also mesenteric nodal disease. Um, but again, when we came to do the gallium, the um, mesenteric nodal mass had enlarged, which didn't, which didn't really fit with the pathology that had been found on biopsy. And actually the, the disease sites showed either no appreciable uptake or, or only low grade uptake, which again, makes you think that this is not low grade net, that this is more aggressive. So biopsy is just a snapshot of the tumor. It will only give you an idea of what's in that particular sample, not the, um, the tumor population as a whole. So that in this case, the patient went on to have an FDG PET CT to guide biopsy so that we could get the most representative sample. And you can see the difference between the two PETs, florid disease on the FDG PET CT and the breast uh, lesion was biopsied and that showed a high grade malignancy. So the patient went on to have chemotherapy rather than a somatostatin analog. And then in um, high grade net, so in this patient, this is an FDG pet, there's a calf lesion, and then there are a couple of nodes, which are very hot. So um, if you didn't know, you probably think that this could be melanoma because of the distribution. Um, and these are the FDG PET CT um, fused images. Biopsy of the node um, showed a Merkel cell carcinoma, which is a high grade neuroendocrine tumor, usually with a skin primary. Um, and the choice, um, the treatment of choice is surgery and radiotherapy where that's amenable. And that's what happened in this patient. So in summary, gallium PET-CT is utilizing low grade nets for staging detection of a primary and for assessment of recurrence. It's not specific for net and other pathologies need to be considered in an appropriate clinical context. And there's no real defined role at present for FDG PET-CT in low grade tumors, but it can be used to guide biopsy where gallium PET-CT is negative or where the tumor is displaying aggressive behavior. And then it can also be used to stage high grade neuroendocrine tumors as well. Thank you. Excellent, thank you everyone. Thank you, Ami, for excellent talk again. Uh, so we are coming up to the Q&A section and I've checked the Q&A and that really not many questions out there. We've got a few more minutes left. Maybe we could just, I've got a few questions for the panel. So Tom, first, if you'd like to come back online. Hello. Tom, um, we've had this before, we've had this discussion before. So just to re-emphasize, do you see a utility for FTG PET in grade one neuroendocrine tumors going through PRRT? Um, I, it's not something that we've really, um, we've really found particularly helpful, um, in our own practice, is it? I don't think, yeah. um, generally speaking, um, the grade one, the, the FTG PET CT is, was, is useful in the, in the context that, I mean, I both said when there's, when there's, uh, significant uncertainty about, um, about the the diagnosis so quite often if um if a patient has a biopsy and it shows a uh, grade one tumor and then um they go on to have a gallium pet ct for staging prior to the prt which would be usual practice then you get a good indication that they're de-differentiated um, if they are de-differentiated just because lots of the lesions show little uptake of gallium or, or less uptake than the liver and that's sufficient to say that perhaps these aren't appropriate this isn't an appropriate patient for um for prt um in that case you might do an fdg pet to um to target biopsy um but with regards to patients who are actively undergoing 
um, PRRT than generally not. Cool. I think that's a key take on point. We use it as a problem solving tool as opposed to just using it as a diagnostic tool to try and help uh, work out the therapeutic aspects of it. Coming on to Andy's talk, um, Andy talked about asking the RSEC license holder, so what do we, how do we answer the question about when to give the, uh, or when to do the particular scan? We tend to actually uh, think about doing the scan, usually at the four-week gap, but we have scanned patients at the three-week gap, which is the 21 days, and in fact, um, at least one patient or maybe two, we've scanned them at two week gap. And guess what? In all of them, we've actually managed to get a good quality scan. So it can be quite variable, but we try and keep practice to as, as a good standard as possible. And in the vast majority of patients, we tend to scan them at four weeks. We do scan them at three weeks because some patients have three weekly intervals of SSA. Exceedingly rarely, we have scanned them at two weeks, but again, we did get good quality images from those patients. Now, actually, I have some questions here from the uh, people who've attended. Uh, we've got a question about what about response assessment? So, Ami, do you want to take that question about how yeah. we assess response? Yeah, that's fine. So, in general, we don't use a uh, gallium PET CT for response assessment. We use cross sectional imaging, and sometimes that's just CT, or sometimes it's a uh, a combination of MR and CT. Um, the sites of disease are often very well demonstrated on CT, so there's no need really for um, gallium in addition unless there's a specific question um, that needs answering or we think that the burden of disease is underestimated on CT and additional disease will change the management. Okay, yeah, and that's that's the key thing. So why, why have we taken that route? Um, partly because um, follow-up gallium PET with a very tight resource, an expensive resource where we use it more for the planning of and for the assessment of tumor when they come in, seems to be a better strategy. However, if we do find it, if we do find that the patient's not behaving as planned, we do quite often enough repeat the scan after a period mm -hmm. of time. So not necessarily for response assessment. I think yeah. we don't have that kind of resources here. And I'm not entirely sure whether it's going to be that useful as well, especially when they've had the four doses of PRRT in this country. That's currently where we stop uh, with the PRRT doses. So we then we do tend to, as Ami indicated, manage them with conventional imaging. Uh, I think Rajiv kind of mentioned about um, utilizing different therapeutic options. So we do look at all therapeutic options, even the high grade patients, because as you know, high grade, there are effectively two groups of patients where they are high grade, well differentiated as opposed to poorly differentiated. Yes, so the therapeutic options for those patients are discussed in the MDT. And we tend to discuss it with the medical oncologist and the clinical oncologist, including the endocrinologist, try and come up with the best treatment options for them. So the last part, I think I just want to emphasize on Army's talk and including Tom's talk, the key that we tend to push for people is try and get pathology. If there's a discrepancy, patient's not behaving appropriately, I think one of the key take home points is scan, discuss, and go for pathology wherever pos possible. Because we've been caught at enough times now. In fact, the last MDT I did last Friday, the patient's hot lymph nodes in the thorax were all lymphoma lesions. So just be very cautious about calling tumor in a patient uh, where there are other pathologies hanging around. Are there any other comments from the panelists? Do you like to add before I call it quits? We've got two more minutes. No, that's good, thank you. Yeah. Andy, anything to add? No, I'm fine, thank you very much. Okay, I think we've also answered the questions on the uh, Q&A section. So, Thank you for participating and attending today's talk and letting us share our experience with you. Hopefully we'll see most of you back uh, in part two of this, where we look at the therapeutics of neuroendocrine tumor uh, and predominantly with PRRT and our experience with that particular treatment modality. Thanks a lot, everyone. Take care. Bye.